Manchinlan number six. We started this program um, in January this year, and I'm very glad to report that we had uh, 400 registration for that particular topic. That's uh, very interesting and very nice to see that we're getting uh, uh, topics that have that get people interested. I'm also very excited to um, have with us today an external speaker. We didn't have uh, so many of those yet. And uh, we have to, with me uh, today, uh, Owen Garrett. He's gonna introduce himself in just a second. Uh, Owen will be uh, delivering a talk on microservices architecture. And um, before I hand over to uh, Owen, I would like to just remind you that uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. First of all, we maintain the calendar of those Munch and Learns um, in, um, in a web, on our website uh, in a page uh, slash campaign slash Munch and Learn with dashes. Uh, I think the team member will copy the links in the, in the chat. You might want to keep the, the chat window open uh, for, for this uh, and, and to see the links and, even to, and also to ask questions. Um, in this page, on this page, you will find the calendar, but also the registration link to get to these sessions and the replay link from the past sessions. So every time we run a session, we record it. Oops, sorry. And uh, we saw the link over there so you can get to it if you missed it. We have two sessions uh, coming up uh, that have been confirmed for July and August. Uh, at the end of July, we have a, a session on how to make data consumable for real world data science. And this will be um, done by HPE data scientists, uh, Helen Friedman and Iveta. And I forgot our last name, I'm sorry about this, but if you go to the website, uh, you'll find that, uh, that information. And in August, end of August, uh, we will have a, a session, which I think is, is quite in line with what uh, Owen will be discussing today called uh, Kubernetes 101. And this one uh, is interesting because for the little story, it was done at Discover, HP Discover last week, uh, but we had a little glitch in the, um, the link sent to the audience for EMEA attendance and people were not able to join the session. So we will be running this session and inviting these people, plus everybody else is also welcome to the session. So it will be uh, delivered by another external speaker, uh, Nigel Poulton. He's a, he's a, a book writer on Kubernetes and uh, a great speaker as well. And I will be um, doing a hands-on lab together with Nigel uh, at the end of the session. So it's an hour and a half session with 30 minutes recorded section and one hour for the hands-on piece. Um, and um, it worked well in the Discover US. It's just that we couldn't do it in Discover EMEA, so we'll do it again. Again, this is a munch and learn. And if you remember the principle we have, and we'd like to continue to make that fun. Uh, so if you want to join our Slack workspace, uh, you can request uh, to join the Slack on slack.hpdev.io. And then you can share your picture. I think it's easier if you use uh, to connect uh, to with your phone uh, of what you have as a, as a munchie. We, we know we have people from all over the world. So uh, it could be any kind of time. So uh, any, anything is accepted there. And uh, let's just to, just to make fun. If you prefer to share on Twitter, uh, use the, the tag HPDev so we can find you there. All right, all the links have been posted by uh, Denis and Fred. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I think let's get into the, the real thing and uh, talk to, have a whole one take over the, the session now. Hey, thank you, Didier. And um, hello, everyone. It's great to meet you, albeit virtually. But my name is, is Owen Garrett. Um, and today I'd like to share with you a presentation which I gave when I worked with Nginx and F5 a few months ago. Um, Didier attended and was, was kind enough to ask that maybe I could share this again with the HPE, HPE community. So that's the background to today's sessions. Um, what I will do over the next 45 to 50 minutes is give you a little bit of a background or an analogy on why microservices are important as people are architecting and deploying modern applications today. What characteristics they have, 
what opportunities they offer, and what challenges they bring. We'll do a very quick roundup of the technology that you'll come across as you consider how to deploy and operate a microservices application in production. And, and as mentioned, I think the Kubernetes 101 and some of the other sessions which are on the HPE agenda will help to back this up and add a little bit more context and information around the technology that you'll use for modern applications based on this architecture. I'll then spend a little bit of time going through in more detail the capabilities of ingress controllers and service meshes as they pertain to microservices apps. This was an area of great interest to the team at Nginx and at F5. And I'll give a little bit of a roundup of the capabilities that you'd expect to gain from using this technology and some of the criteria that you might want to bear in mind before you to decide to, to deploy them. And finally, um, referencing the work that we're now doing at Deep Fence around security, I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking and introducing you to some of the concepts and technologies that you might want to bear in mind as you think about how you secure your microservices application. Because just as the platform, the networking, the delivery technology is very different with microservices, likewise, security concerns are also very, very different. So that should give us something to cover over the next 45 to 50 minutes. Please, if you have any questions, just throw them into the Q&A. Um, we have a couple of polls which we'll ask as we proceed, just to keep things, keep things light. That's a great opportunity to throw in some, some comments. Um, Didier and I, Didier and I will spot those and address those as we go through. Let's begin with our first poll, just to warm things up as we get started. Um, what's your expertise, either speak on your own behalf or behalf of your organization, you know, with respect to microservices? Is it option one, something that's completely new to you? You're here to learn, you're looking for the basics. Is it something that you feel comfortable with, but you're not yet using in production? Or maybe you've taken some first steps. Perhaps it's something that you and your organization are using in production alongside traditional architectures, monolithic and other cloud architectures, or maybe you'd regard yourselves as being entirely microservices first. So the answers are coming in. Um, we have over 50% of you have responded. Thank you very much. And what we're seeing, I think we can close the poll now, but nobody, 1%, one response has said, we are entirely microservices first. Shall I uh, share the result? Uh, or... Yes, please do, please do. <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, so only one person says they're entirely microservices first. Um, then we have, let me just move the Zoom control bar. So 37, so over 50% of, of you, 60% either are here to learn the very, very basics or it's something that you feel comfortable with, but you haven't taken first steps to put into production. So let's, be, I'll bear that in mind as we go through and as we deal with, with any questions as they come through. When I think about microservices, it always helps to have a little bit of an analogy. And I'd like to start by talking to you about shipbuilding in Europe, round about the 16th century. Shipbuilding in Europe, wooden based ships, barks and brigs and the like, were built almost, as, almost like monoliths. They were built in place by hand and it took many, many months to build a ship with a very, very skilled team of craftsmen, of engineers and shipwrights, riggers and the like, who built the ship as a unit, laying down the keel, building the hull around it, putting the deck in place, measuring and stepping the masts and, and other components, until six months later, a ship would emerge from the workshop. This process created ships of great quality, of great sophistication, but it was very slow, it was very inefficient. The Venetians pioneered a new way of building ships. They created an industrial complex called the Venetian Arsenal, 
from the 12th century onwards. And it was of its time the most powerful, the most efficient enterprise for building ships in the world. And as a result, the Venetians managed a fleet of almost 20,000 ships across the Mediterranean, a combination of military ships, of commercial ships, and they became the trading power of the northern Mediterranean. The arsenal, the factory they built, was able to build a ship every day, and they maintained a large backlog of ships of various specifications. They could flip the production line on boat by boat to create anything from a merchant trading ship through to an armed truck, an armed galley. And they even illustrated they could outfit this ent an entire ship from parts just over lunchtime with a visit from, Henry the from King Henry of France. How did they do it? If we look at contemporary data from the time of what the Venetian arsenal looked like, you can see that it was a little bit like a modern production line, where they began with constructing the hulls, caulking, waterproofing the ship, and then outfitting various parts onto the boat before it then moved through for final fitting. And of course, being Venetian, being Italian, stopping by the bakery at the very end for the stores. And you might stop and think their innovation was just, it was just a production line. They were able to build lots of, lots of ships in sequence and move them through the blind quickly. But when you look in detail at what it was they were doing, it was so much more than that. The Venetians, in fact, were the pioneers for an industrial process now known as interchangeable parts. They did not build every ship on a case-by-case -case basis with bespoke parts, fitting it out as it went through the production line. Instead, they took multiple standardized components from the hulls, through the masts, to the fittings, to the rigging, to the sails, and they built and accumulated all of those in separate workshops dotted around the arsenal. And as a result, they could then move a vessel through the arsenal very quickly and hit that goal of outfitting a ship from hull to finished product over lunchtime. Why was this revolutionary? Why was this interchangeable parts approach so important for them? And what's its relevance to applications today? Well, if you're building a ship, it's an expensive asset. It's something which needs to be on the water, serving its purpose for a life of 20 or 30 years or more. But during its lifetime, it requires regular maintenance. It requires regular upgrades. Um, in the case of the Venetians, Galileo was contracted to work on the designs of oars for the boats, and those would often be changed in place. There may be a repair needed to a ship, damage in combat or wear and tear at use, and parts of, of the rigging or the steering may need to be replaced. Or new technology may come along. Um, new standards for ropes might mean that the ship can handle heavier, more weighty rigging and sails, and so you may wish to re-outfit re the sail, the ship with new sailing gear. When you regard the ship as a monolith, as the majority of European manufacturers did, then every ship is slightly unique. When work needs to be done to do repairs or outfit new parts, the ship needs to be measured up, the team needs to be brought in, it needs to, the parts need to be removed and new parts fitted. But when you build the ship with an approach that it's a collection of interchangeable parts, then you're able to go through the development the building of new parts, testing, putting them into production, and then releasing the ship, you can do that on individual parts of the ship. And if necessary, do it in multiple cases in parallel. If the ship needs new fittings for oars, you can fit those, taking the parts out of your, your library, your store of pre-made parts. Similarly, new rigging, new steering gear can all be taken independently from, from stores fitted to the boat and the boat be brought back into service much, much more quickly than if every part of the boat is bespoke. And we see 
a similar pattern as we look at how applications are built today with two different approaches. The monolithic approach for building applications, something which has served us well for many years, takes all of the components that the application requires. Here we have a, a fictional you know, Uber-like um, ride booking system. We take all those components and we bind them together tightly to create a single monolithic, monolithic single deployable object that instantiates our application. And when we need to go through the process of fixing a bug, so repairing part of the application, or upgrading, putting in place a, a faster user interface or a more reliable adapter, then we need to go through the develop, the build, the test, the deploy, and the release cycle on the application as a whole. This is typically a long and involved process, and it greatly limits how quickly the application can be updated. Organizations often follow waterfall-like approaches. When they build applications in this way, they bring together multiple changes, and then they do this release process in one go for multiple changes, rather than on demand. What we see with a microservices application is like a Venetian galley. It's split into multiple interchangeable parts that are loosely coupled. One part can be pulled out and replaced with an updated part without having to measure up or update the entire application. What this means is that the application can now go through the develop, build, test, deploy and release cycle in parallel, each component being managed independently, developed through to released independently and in parallel, meaning that updates to the application can be made much more quickly. Whether it's a bug fix, a faster user interface or a more reliable adapter. This means that the business that relies on this application is able to adapt and evolve much more rapidly in a much more agile fashion, responding to commercial threats, responding to security vulnerabilities, or simply bringing maintenance releases into production much, much more quickly. The approach of breaking a monolithic application down into small independent components is exactly what is known as microservices. The microservices architecture is described as an approach where a single application is composed of loosely coupled, not tightly bound, but loosely coupled, independently deployable, smaller services. Those services are designed to be maintainable and testable independently of each other. They're small, they're very well defined. The services are loosely coupled, not tightly bound. They use lightweight APIs, REST or streaming APIs to communicate. They can be deployed independently. They're not part of one large monolith. Instead, each component can be deployed typically as a container, but not necessarily, and can be scaled or patched independently of other components. From an organizational perspective, these services are often organized around business capabilities rather than functionality. It's tempting to think that you could break an application down by function and then build a service for each of those functions. But what organizations have found um, that works more efficiently is creating what's described as a bounded context. That's the role of the service with respect to the business. Often, the services are wrapped around data that instantiates part of the business, whether it's an inventory or a billing or transaction system, or it may be organized around a function of the business. Those teams, the teams that own and operate those services then are aligned with those individual lines of business. And as another general rule, the smaller the team, the more efficient it can be in managing their particular function. So there's a, a rule going around, a rule of thumb that if the team requires more than two pizzas to feed it on a team lunch, then it's probably a little bit too big. So we look, the, the rule of thumb ap appears to point at teams of round about five to six people in order to operate most efficiently 
in an agile fashion without the huge overhead of, of corporate um, interactions and politics and transactions in order to reconcile and align what individual teams are doing. So this approach dramatically different to the idea of building a large monolith that is then deployed on a slow and periodic basis. Let's take another pause and let's ask another question um, about microservices. We asked before, you know, how, how many people are familiar with microservices versus here to learn? And about 60% of the audience said, we're here to learn, we have, a, we have a bit of a familiarity, but we're not ready to put it into production yet. And as I talked with users um, and, core, and enterprises in this space, there were a number of different concerns that they had about moving to a microservices architecture. Microservices promises great benefits, but it brings with it a lot of new practices and technologies. It brings some problems in production around visibility, around security, around scalability. Um, but some, you know, many people, or some people at least, may have deployed it in production, got it working, and be happy from end to end with the technology. So if we look again, we've got over 50% of you who's responded. Thank you. So I'll just end that poll. And we're seeing, so I can share the results. About half of us on this call are just find that the training and knowledge, getting, getting started, getting the first microservice to production is hard. And that's something which is echoed in many of the conversations that, that I and Didier and others will have had with the community. There's so much new to learn, the cognitive load of understanding how to go from the concept, the architectural concept into production is really, really high. And it's not something which we can cover in just a, a single webinar like this, but I think the agenda of webinars that HPE have lined up will help to cover many of the bases in what you might need to know about getting a microservice into production. And then for those who are deploying microservices in production, visibility, monitoring, and logging are critical. Scaling to large applications or to multiple teams is a challenge. And security is also a challenge for many people, but maybe not the biggest concern. Just it sounds like just getting the thing into production, getting it working is the play, is the challenge that we're all facing at the moment. Uh, Owen, there's a there's a remark in the a question in the in the chat about from Elizabeth about uh, binded context and uh, how to minimize the scope creep. Sure. Okay. So, so the, the idea of a bounded context, that is the, the envelope where the border within a microservice lies. And as I mentioned, it is very tempting just to think about a microservice as implementing a piece of functionality. An operation such as scaling an image or doing a database lookup. And in some cases, that works if it is a discrete standalone operation. Um, then by all means, that can be published as a microservice. But if you think about either breaking a microservice down too much, so maybe you create a microservice that wraps just around a database and abstracts that, or if you create a microservice that's too big, a microservice that implements an entire end-to-end -end business process, those fall on either end of the spectrum of what is useful. A microservice that is too small is very difficult for an external party to consume because it doesn't give enough information about how best to use that service. And a microservice that's too big provides too much of an opinionated view on how that service should be consumed. The Goldilocks is to create a microservice around a business process that either you wish to expose from the back end. So the business process could be something such as I wish to log and follow through a transaction, or I wish to initiate some sort of machine learning operation. So that's one approach, the backend microservice that you wish an internal user to consume, or the other type that works well is the front-end microservice. This is the service that you would expose to an external third party to operate. So the third party may wish to put through an order you could create a microservice that presents the order taking interface 
and it then conceals or abstracts all of the individual microservices which sit behind. So in a kind of a facade like fashion. So think about the microservice, not in terms of a technical function, but in terms of a business function. And is it something which is an internal capability that you wish to expose to internal users? Or is it an external capability that is concealing and abstracting away the internal implementation? So I hope that helps. There are, there really are no, there are, there are some various guidelines. There's no hard and fast rules on exactly what the scope for a microservice should be, but those are a couple of guidelines that you can bear in mind. Um, yes, and someone has shared the All About Lean link. So that's where the, the maps that you saw and some of the background information I shared came from. Um, it's a fantastic illustration, I think, the Venetian arsenal of how replaceable parts gave Venetians a huge competitive advantage in terms of merchant shipping and how you can use those lessons in terms of microservices architectures. So let's move on. We have some concerns around microservices and just getting into production is the biggest challenge. And what we see as we go from a monolithic approach to a microservices approach, is there are things that we need to reevaluate and relearn. The architectures that we use change from the traditional three tier Java like architectures. The protocols tend to go, tend to move to much more lightweight, portable, consumable protocols, such as REST and JSON. Microservices should be architected to be transient meaning that individual components can be torn down, taken down, redeployed and scaled independently. This takes us to the pattern pioneered by Docker and other container thought leaders around immutable infrastructure. Once a microservice is deployed, it remains deployed. If you need to make a change to it, apply a security patch, then you don't patch it in place. Instead, you redeploy a new version. That makes it much easier to then operate your infrastructure as code with an orchestration engine using something like Kubernetes. By being able to deploy microservices independently, take them into production without having to deploy the entire application, that takes you away from big bang releases towards the ability to do continuous delivery, whereby small, well-contained changes to an individual microservice can be safely deployed into production without having to do entire end-to-end -end tests on the entire application. But in order to make this work, it also means some big social and practical changes in how your teams are organized, going from traditional siloed teams of dev, of test and operations, through to a DevOps culture where individual engineers take a much broader responsibility for the application from development through deployment and then to operations in production. There are a couple of pieces of technology that you will almost certainly come across as you look at microservices and you look at the technology and infrastructure necessary to deploy them. The first is containers. This speaks to our comments that a microservice should be broken into small deployable parts that can be redeployed and treated as cattle rather than larger maybe application center, center, server centric parts that you treat as pets. And these little parts are best instantiated as containers. Containers are a fantastic tool, even if you're not doing microservices, for building an application, running it in a test environment. So I use them when I'm building Go code on, on my laptop. It's a Mac laptop, but I can build Go code targeting a Linux service, run it on my laptop, test it, and then as a container, push it to a repository and deploy the exact same container into a Kubernetes environment. So going from code to container means that during the packaging, the testing, the deploying and the production stages, I know exactly what it is that I'm running. I'm not hunting around trying to find the right environment for my Go or PHP or Python or Java code with the right patches and the right versions of the app server. Everything is wrapped up and contained within that container object. So containers have emerged as being the lightweight way 
of taking code and packaging up, packaging it up as a runnable artifact that can be deployed onto a wide range of production environments without having to QA and test heavily on that production environment before it's deployed. And the production environments that you will see with microservices architecture now very commonly center around Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, is seen, is sometimes regarded as the platform that containers run on. In fact, Kubernetes is really just the orchestration part of that platform, but it's convenient to use Kubernetes as the label for, for everything, just as one might use Linux as the label for the entire GNU, GNU Linux ecosystem. Kubernetes is a little bit like um, VM, VMware vSphere is to containers. Kubernetes is to virtual machines. Kubernetes is to containers. Kubernetes takes a series of hosts um, known as nodes in Kubernetes speak, and it stitches these together to create a flat platform where containers can be run. It has a master component. This is the components that you would interact with, the API server and the various controller tools which you interact with to declare what services and what policies you would like to be deployed. And that master then deploys those services so it orchestrates them across the various nodes using the kubelet service running at each of those nodes. Kubernetes networking is on the face of it very, very simple. It operates a single flat network across all of those nodes. The principle being that any service running on any of those nodes can talk to any other service using a predictable IP address or service endpoint. And it makes no difference whether the destination for traffic is based on the same node or on a remote node. The, the Kubernetes flat internal network makes that really, really simple. But the implementation behind it using Kube proxy is in fact extremely complex to achieve that degree of simplicity. Kubernetes then deploys or orchestrates the workloads, the containers or pods across those various nodes. So putting those two things together, Kubernetes and containers, those are the two pieces of technology you're almost certain to see within an application environment to support a microservice application. But there's a lot of technology which sits around and is needed in order to support the process of building, testing, deploying, and operating applications on this environment. On the development side, you'll come across the process of continuous integration. Developer, a developer will work on an individual service or component, commit that to a repository, which will then go through a build and test process, create a container and push that to a container repo. Your DevOps team will then monitor through various techniques what's sitting within that repo, review and then push it into production with a continuous delivery process. Um, it may look like it's manual from this process. To begin with, it may well be, but the goal of course is to automate everything end to end. And then the operations team will sit and monitor what is happening in production, deploying security measures, such as firewall and authentication, and then monitoring and processing logs in order to understand how effectively the applications are running in production and to monitor the efficiency of applying rolling upgrades and other kinds of deployments. And finally, our users will interact with our application. Traffic will come in through infrastructure load balancers, per application load balancers, and hit our Kubernetes clusters and access the services running within. Operating the application is really, really hard. As I mentioned before, the, the cognitive load of Kubernetes is very, very high. It takes an experienced team to be able to run Kubernetes in production and to react to changes and to ensure the availability and the performance and the stability that you need from that platform. Then breaking an application into a microservice environment into a microservice approach makes things only makes things more difficult. You end up replacing reliable, well understood processes with slow, unreliable network distributed alternatives. 
And so in order to manage and contain this, what you really need to be able to do is to control what is happening within the application data plane with technologies such as the ingress controller and the service mesh. So let's, for the remainder of the time, talk about the capabilities and the selection criteria that you might have for each of these, these options. So let's begin first with the ingress controller. It deals with a challenge of how do I get traffic to my services into Kubernetes? And how can I do that in a secure, reliable, and self-service manner? You face many challenges at scale. Applications have complex needs. Teams need to collaborate in order to share the environment safely. And so let's take another poll. Um, I'm curious to know, whoops, let's go back a slide. What ingress solutions are people using currently? Um, I appreciate that many people on the earlier polls were just looking at microservices. They may not be running things like Kubernetes in production. So we'll keep this short. We'll, we'll, we won't look for quite as many responses. We're getting about a third of people have, have voted. It's climbing. I'll wait until it begins to stabilize. And what we're seeing is the vast majority of people just don't know what's being used. About a third of our responses are using the default solution, the default Kubernetes ingress controller. Um, some people are using OpenShift for Red Hat, OpenShift Router for Red Hat. Some people are using a third party ingress controller. We actually have a few uh, suggested uh, third party in the, in the chat. Nginx, okay. Istio, uh, Nginx again, Nginx. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant, yes. So in terms of third party options, Istio, the Nginx ingress controller and a few others are common options. And we'll look at those in a moment. The job of an ingress controller is to be a specialized load balancer for your Kubernetes environment. It runs within Kubernetes and perhaps the most important single capability or aspect of an ingress controller is that it is managed by Kubernetes itself. The configuration sits in Kubernetes. As a service scales up and down, the ingress controller learns that service has changed and it adapts its load balancing rules in a, in a corresponding fashion. So it's tightly coupled, Kubernetes centric, because developers and DevOps teams who use Kubernetes look for Kubernetes itself to be the primary source of truth for what is happening with their application. There are a lot of ingress controller options available. There is, of course, the default Kubernetes ingress controller. That's the one on the first column on this chart. And if you're interested in considering various ingress controller options, I'll, I could strongly recommend starting with this chart from Learn K8's research, which compares, it does a fairly accurate and non-partisan comparison of the capabilities of different ingress controller options. So I think I'm sure we'll share this slide afterwards or a quick Google for Learn K8's research, Kubernetes ingress controllers, and you'll find this rather excellent comparison of different ingress controllers and the capabilities that they offer. Like, I met, like other Kubernetes-based objects, ingress controllers take their configuration from the Kubernetes API. Using a, an object of kind ingress, it's a simple specification of the endpoints that I want to receive traffic on, so foo.bar.com, paths how I want to split traffic and the destination service for those for that uh, particular traffic. And ingress controllers began with this basic Kubernetes ingress object as a way of supporting multiple services behind a single endpoint. But what we find over the last couple of years is that this approach is quite limited. It's difficult to apply advanced configuration for your ingress controller. It's challenging to allow multiple users, multiple teams to collaborate and build the ingress policy. And so you'll see the emergence of more advanced approaches for ingress controller configuration. The, the Nginx ingress controller, so this is the third party ingress controller um, developed by the F5 and Nginx team, different to the standard Kubernetes ingress controller, 
is one good example of the modern approach for configuring ingress controllers, whereby it takes a concept. So again, this is all driven through your Kubernetes configuration through custom resources with a concept of a virtual server defining what the ingress controller should listen on and where it should route traffic to. The ability, if necessary, to delegate some of that as a virtual server route so that perhaps an admin team can be responsible for managing the endpoints, the listen points on Kubernetes, but individual DevOps teams can manage the load balancing policies for their own applications. Additional functionality is abstracted out as policies, which can be managed independently by other teams and then applied as needed. So think again, come back to our, our Venetian galley approach, whereby the rigging, the sails, the masts, the steering were all managed independently and then assembled together. Policies allow you to do that, different teams managing security or access control policies. And in the case of Nginx, you can even embed Nginx configuration directly as, as an expert user may wish to do if they wish to fine tune the load balancer underneath or apply configuration or policies which are not supported by the abstractions of the ingress resources. Nginx's approach was very early to market. Um, this has been in production for, I think, two or three years now. There are other initiatives within the Kubernetes community to solve the problem in, this, in a similar sort of way. There is a, a collaboration around a new architecture called the, rather confusingly called the Gateway API. I think the Kubernetes team are looking to distance themselves from the concept of an ingress resource. And the Gateway API attempts to do the same thing that the Nginx team did by taking the configuration to get traffic into Kubernetes and breaking that out by function and by user so that complex configurations can be assembled from multiple different resources. This is at a fairly early stage of implementation, but once when you, when you get to grips either with an Nginx approach or a, comp a competing approach, you can meet, meet much more complex use cases with your ingress controller. You can automate common DevOps processes by steering traffic to different destinations, perhaps separating internal debug requests against external production requests. You can split traffic to do in-production A-B testing. You can bypass or avoid having to implement things like error pages or circuit breakers in your application by instead implementing those on the ingress controller in front. Rate limiting authentication, web app firewall or, or rich configuration. So a modern ingress controller solution gives you a lot of flexibility and allows you to overcome some of the internal limitations on what Kubernetes allows you to do with respect to handling complex traffic for complex apps. But an ingress controller only goes so far. Many operational challenges for your Kubernetes microservice application happen within the application, not at the edge. And you may ask, how can I secure and manage traffic inside my Kubernetes environment, just as I might do with an ingress controller for traffic coming from outside? Remember that an ingress controller is a little bit like a web application firewall. It sits at the edge of your Kubernetes environment, and it manages requests coming from outside to inside the environment. So end user requests, load balancing them across different kinds of services. But your Kubernetes application is probably made up of multiple different components that need to talk with each other internally. This is known as east-west traffic. It's internally generated and it happens between different components or services of your Kubernetes application. And in order to handle this sort of traffic, you could trombone it out through an ingress controller at each point, but that's, that's inefficient and hard to manage. The emerging technology to control that traffic within Kubernetes is what's known as a service mesh. So before we go in 
and we do a quick roundup of, of service mesh technology. I'm curious to know, so we have another poll going, um, do people use a service mesh in production? Um, you don't know, maybe you haven't got plans, but you're, or maybe you're evaluating, you could be using something like Istio, you could be using an alternative. Meshes are fairly advanced pieces of technology. It's an emerging, it's an, it's an emerging architecture. In for many users, the cognitive load again is high. So we could say that we're not ready for a mesh yet. What we're seeing is that, so I'll, I'll end that poll and share the results so you can see for yourselves. A lot of people don't know whether a mesh is, is in, in use or not. We have almost 20% are actively evaluating mesh approaches. Um, the, one of the most commonly deployed service meshes is an open source project called Istio, but there are other options as well, as we'll see in a moment. What is the purpose of a service mesh? Well, a service mesh is there to try and improve how traffic is controlled within the application. The purpose of a service mesh is a largely is threefold. When multiple components are talking to each other, you may wish to secure that traffic um, using mutual TLS or something similar, um, often hand in hand with one of HP's only own, own projects of so Spiffy and Spire. You may wish to manage the traffic to do more fine-grained load balancing, rate limiting, or circuit breaking between individual components. And you'll want to measure the traffic using a service mesh, either for real-time monitoring, so Prometheus metrics, so who's talking to what, what's the latency, what's the response time, what's the error rate, or perhaps open tracing, grabbing traces from individual transactions to look at when a request comes in, how that fans out or cascades out to hit multiple other services within the environment. These are the kind of problems that a service mesh attempts to solve. And nearly all service mesh implementations currently seek to solve these by embedding little proxies known as sidecar proxies alongside every single container. The sidecar pro proxy catches traffic leaving the container or traffic entering the container, and it creates tunnels between individual containers for mutual TLS. It performs the load balancing for traffic from container to container, and the proxy generates the traffic instrumentation, the telemetry for traces and real-time monitoring. Service mesh technology is relatively new. Production quality service meshes have been available in to varying degrees of, of enterprise readiness for the last couple of years. And once again, the Learn K8 team have done a fantastic job of gathering the top service meshes that are available today and providing a comparison chart so you can get a sense of the, diff the varying capabilities that each service mesh provides. Putting them together, service meshes give, allow you to meet a number of useful use cases. Many of these use cases you could meet yourself using existing technology, but the promise of a service mesh is that it will do so in a much more automated and hands-off fashion. Securing traffic, providing the instrumentation, routing, access control, and egress control. But a word to the wise for service meshes. They are very complex, very invasive, very intrusive bits of technology. The success of a service mesh relies critically on how effectively the control plane can monitor what's happening in your Kubernetes environment and keep the configuration for those proxies in sync and up to date with the state of the application running within Kubernetes. There can be challenges around adding latency, performance and resource impacts, and possibly even affecting the availability of an application. From what I've seen, from users who've deployed service meshes in production, there is a fairly high demand on skilled Kubernetes administrators to, to babysit and manage the mesh in production. Check that it's being deployed correctly, fine tune, performance tune, security tune it. And so it's not something which I'd say is ready for, for someone to deploy 
out of the box for their first Kubernetes application. It's something you should consider as part of the journey of adopting Kubernetes and deploying applications within. I would say you're ready to consider a service mesh when first of all, you're fully invested in using microservices and in using Kubernetes. Because most contemporary service meshes do not work very well with components that sit outside of Kubernetes. So service mesh applicable if you are 90 or 100% Kubernetes. You're ready if you solve some of the other challenges that sit around operating Kubernetes. If you haven't got a fully automated pipeline for deploying applications, fix that first before you try and fix the problems that service mesh purports to address. A service mesh is useful if you're deploying frequently per, to production and there is a high risk of failure and there's a high need to control traffic. If on the other hand, your application environment is pretty steady, doesn't change frequently, then the capabilities a service mesh brings are less applicable to your environment. If you want to use a service mesh for debugging transactions, for understanding how the application behaves, then once the application gets beyond a certain threshold of complexity in services and in depth, um, various rules of thumb exist. Um, most commonly, um, IBM, Aspen Mesh, and others are saying when you have more than 20 to 25 services, when the depth of the application is three node, three services deep or more, that's the point at which it's hard to keep the entire architecture and operation of the application in your head. So you need help from a service mesh. If the application is simpler than that, then you can probably avoid. You need mutual TLS and you're prepared to learn and if necessary, prepared to, to accept the odd failure. So service meshes are not for everybody, but are emerging technology that you should absolutely be watching. As we wrap today, I just wanted to introduce one additional topic, which is around security. Something which is very, very close to my mind with the work that we're doing at Deep Fence. We've looked at some of the challenges of operating applications and keeping them reliable in production, but there's also significant challenges around keeping those applications secure in production. Microservices are highly distributed. They are built on complex stacks of very fast moving open source software. A typical modern application has over 500 components. Vulnerabilities take a long time to be discovered and are being discovered at a very, very high rate. So it's very, microservices applications have a very broad and hard to secure attack service. You look at a range of different technologies to, to secure those applications before deployment in production and afterwards. And Deep Fence are pioneering work around detecting vulnerabilities in components that applications use and building a real-time topology of how those components relate to the traffic that the application is receiving from the outside world and within. We have a range of sensors in order to detect anomalies within the application, be it file system or process anomalies, or attack traffic that's trying to exploit vulnerabilities. And we can use those sensors along with our map of the vulnerability to make intelligent decisions on when and how it's necessary to protect applications. If you'd like to find out more about what we do at Deep Fence, my, my contact details are at the very end of this deck. But let's just review and say, what have we learned in the last couple of minutes? We learned that microservices is not a quick destination. It's a commitment that you need to take in order to refactor your applications and to deploy them in a way that take best advantage of the technology available. Begin with services where you need to iterate and improve those services as a high priority. Microservices are less applicable for applications that are fairly steady, well-established and don't change frequently. You're gonna come across containers, you're gonna come across Kubernetes, so be ready, um, look for pilot projects. You don't have to go the microservices route 
just to start building some internal expertise on how to operate containers and how to run Kubernetes. Look at how you can control the data plane using technologies such as ingress controllers and service meshes. And finally, do you be ready for some new challenges around security as well, both understanding the vulnerabilities within your application and detecting issues in production, in runtime, and then resolving those in real time. So I'm not sure how much more time we can, we can take with this goal, we but have very, a, very happy to, yeah, to run through some questions or take, take some feedback. Yeah, there's a few questions that we haven't answered. Uh, the first one is pretty early on in the talk. Uh, from Roland, and it's more like a remark. And he was saying that uh, about the scope of services is uh, that might be important is the relationship with data. He said in the in the days of SOAP, there was a WSDL or CORBA, and it was driven by data, the data model. Uh, yeah. And maybe this is a, a kind of another angle to look at the scope of services. Yes. Yeah. That's 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 a really good point. Um, the data often corresponds pretty well with a particular business function and a microservice can wrap the data and provide an interface to that data that matches what the business function is, whether that is checking for inventory or processing a transaction. There was another question about uh, if uh, service mesh from different vendors interoperate. Um, so they don't, unfortunately. Um, the reason they don't is that each service mesh has its own control plane. So it's made of two components, sidecar proxy and the control plane, and different vendors' control planes don't interoperate. There are a couple of caveats to that. One is that there is a standard interface called the SMI spec, service mesh interface, that attempts to create a standard way of configuring the control plane. And then there is a vendor called solo.io who are creating a control plane of control planes, if you like, which attempts to be agnostic to the underlying service mesh. So, there, so in general, they don't interoperate. Um, in practice, there are a couple of things that may help if you're looking to run two service meshes side by side. All right, thank you. I, I believe I answered that the other question, but maybe uh, you want to take it to uh, what's uh, somebody was asking, uh, Rama was asking, uh, what's a Canary and Blue Green upgrades? Hey, great question. So, as I mentioned, um, with microservices applications, you can deploy components on demand. So, if you need to change a particular component, maybe for a bug fix, you can do that in production while the application is running. And the way that you would do that is generally described as a Canary or a Blue Green release. In a Canary release, you might deploy a new version of a component, and then you would tell the ingress controller or the service mesh to route a tiny proportion of traffic to that new version. So it's a Canary. It's named after the Canary in the coal mine. The idea being that, unfortunately, in a coal mine, the Canary is the first thing to die if there is a gas leak. So if the Canary dies, you evacuate the coal mine. In a Canary deployment, if there's a fault in the new version of the application, the canary may die, but it only impacts the, the one or two percent of traffic you're routing to it. So that's the canary as a way of testing in production. Once the canary release passes, you do a blue-green release. So in a blue-green release, you, that is the process of switching traffic from one version of a service, the blue service, to a new version, the green service. So those are, the those are the techniques that you'll hear when you, when you learn about deploying applications and upgrading them in production on Kubernetes. Uh, there's a few more questions. Uh, the last two, I think. Uh, there was one uh, from Marcel about uh, how, uh, how to build uh, an update manifest and how microservice can be independently developed and deployed. That's, that's probably a little bit beyond the, the scope of what we can cover, cover today. <laughs> um, there, are, there are capabilities that Kubernetes offers um, with its deployments and rolling upgrades. So a deployment represents a group of, of pods that provide a service. And a Kubernetes rolling upgrade allows you to change those pods 
in production. It will tear down the old versions of an application and deploy the new image with a commitment that, for example, no more than 25% of services are, are down, of instances are down. So there are techniques like that, or meshes and ingress controllers provide abstractions on top of that with more fine-grained load balancing control. Thank you. Uh, when there's a, a remark from Linard, which I think is interesting, uh, he, he thinks that uh, there's iner inherently high, higher latency uh, in a microservice architecture than in a monolithic architecture. Yes. Is is asking what's the take on uh, in the DevOps world on that? So, um, so I'd say yes. Um, in many many cases, there is, and the cost of the Kubernetes can end up requiring substantially more resource than a monolithic application in order to give the same level of performance, because you're having to push things out across the network. A lot of that comes from careful design of the application and use of persistent and fast protocols such as gRPC within the app so that you can minimize the individual network transactions and the latency for those. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to check if we missed anyone. Uh, there is a question from Ravi about how about NetOps, SecOps? Uh, how about, how about also by Istio or any other? Oh, are, are the service mesh uh doing any net ops sec ops i think that's what i understand from the question but i'm not 100 percent sure let me just see if i can go if i can see that question it's, uh 602 p.m if you yeah hi, yeah higher net ops and sec ops served by istio or other third-party mesh tools the kubernetes and tools tends to be more focused towards the needs of devops and dev sec ops so they're Kubernetes centric, very, very API centric and very fine grained, specific to individual applications or services. And in, in my experience, at least, and this may be different to others, the, the role of NetOps and SecOps tends to be a little bit more global and sits more outside of Kubernetes, providing edge security and edge monitoring for large volumes of applications rather than fine-grained per application management. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, we'll stop here. Uh, thank you for answering the poll, the last questions here about uh, the usefulness of, of these type of sessions. Uh, the slides remind you how to reach and join and uh, contribute to the HP Dev community. So don't be shy. Um, join us on the different channels, whether you're more on a Slack or um, a Yammer or uh, we check out our workshops on demand. We have uh, this uh, Kubernetes session that we'll be doing uh, end of August. I forgot to say that we have it already available as a workshop on demand. So you can take that even if you don't, uh, you're not available end of August. I think it's, it's nice to have uh, our speaker, but if you want to take it on your own, you can do that. So uh, all those links, uh, we'll, we'll share those links as well. Uh, I'll share Owen's slides uh, when, he, when I send the follow-up email uh, with you guys. And with that, I would like to really thank Owen. That was a great session, very uh, instructive, uh, a lot of passion. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and sticking with us uh, for all this time. Thank you very much. And have yeah, a thank you. rest of your day. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great to meet you all. Cheers. Thank you, Owen.